You may be seated. Amen. What a beautiful name it is. It's great to sing about Jesus Christ, always to sing about him. Go to Acts chapter number two as an intro today, and then we'll head off into Colossians for a little bit, and we'll just cover a few verses. We're going to look at um, the next three Sundays. Maybe some of you have seen uh, a little slide going through the loop of our announcements, but um, praising God 2020. We're going to praise him and and praise him for what he has done in restoring the body principle in the local church. Thank you for what you have done, dear God. I've got an initial slide up there. We're not going to go all the way back to, to January for any length of time other than to look at a few slides. I'm going to use a number of announcement slides this morning for our first few minutes to walk through some of the things that... God has done to restore the body, but I, I really would like you to see uh, where we're uh, going. You're going to hear a, a little bit about some things out of uh, the book of Acts in chapter number two, only for, uh, uh, for the month of December. I'm going to speak about what God would have us to do, some things that have been uh, stirring in my heart and, and from the Lord, and, and uh, God has been stirring in me for for, uh, for a while, for a couple, two or three years, ever since our 20th anniversary and, and some of the things that in my prayer time and my study time and, and my, just my personal worship time that God has been bringing to me. And, and part of it has to do with, a big part of it has to do with Acts chapter number two, the last few verses. When we have our uh, we, uh, missions on Wednesday, I've been reading this passage every, every Wednesday to be able to to really just give everyone that is in that audience of, of our Wednesdays a, a, just a reminder of how the church got cranking, how the church, out of Acts chapter number one, of uh, being told that they're going to receive power to be the witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're looking and staring and gazing, and, and Jesus says, uh, uh, Jesus has gone into heaven. Jesus is, is, is uh, going into heaven, and that's where he's at, the right hand of the Father, and then the men of Galilee, uh, excuse me, the, the angels speak and say, you men of Galilee, why stand you up in he into heaven? Why are you gazing? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him. And of course then they get into the upper room and there's 120 and reminded that there was the uh, 12, the, the 70, the 120 that are there and we're reminded also too of Peter, James, and John of uh, how they are so close to the Lord. And so you've got this disciple-making model that's been going on for Jesus' earthly ministry. Again, if you go back to our study we just had on the Sermon on the Mount, we really looked at Jesus' beginning preaching message and how he preached to the Jews and the audience and the multitudes that were gathered, but also that he had his disciples right near him, and they were learning of his truth and understanding that Everything he was saying was going to go back to and reference back to his righteousness, his kingdom. It was going to be about, and it's always been about, the kingdom of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. Going back to Acts chapter number 2 then, as we're going to look at something today, talking about praising God in 2020, we're reminded uh, of the fact that this church model that we sit in, 21st century, over 2,000 years uh, since the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the first coming. And to think that in all the prophecy that's in the Bible and in all, all of man's uh, recounting of prophecy, uh, there's so many times that we would say, hey, the rapture should have happened a long time ago. We, the church should have been called out and, and the tribulation period should have got cranking and, and, and everything should have happened and all the eschatology stuff that comes flooding through your mind and through your thinking process of your knowledge and wisdom and understanding of the Bible, you're going, well, I don't know. We're still here. So what are we supposed to do? Well, we're just going to tread water for a while. We're just going to doggy paddle for a while. We're going to go in the deep end, get scared, have a life preserver pull us out, and then we're just going to say, I'm going to sit on the island, I'm going to sit on land, and I'm not going to go out. And, and that's not what Jesus Christ told these guys to do, and that's not what they did. And in Acts chapter number 2, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we're reminded that after the day, uh, what happens in the day of Pentecost, in verse number 
uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and how all these different people groups, they're hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ in their language. And they're saying that these, the apostles, are of much wine, of new wine, full of new wine. There's got to be something wrong with them. But of course, Peter standing up in verse number 14, we realize that he's going to clear up everything. And he's going to speak truth. And then he's going to get into preaching the gospel message. He's going to go into a little history of the way the Jews were, how they rejected God's plan for them, how they really truly didn't understand what God was doing throughout the ages. Then he goes into verse 21 and says, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. He interjects immediately. And it's all about Jesus Christ and calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And how Israel is the one that he's preaching to at this time. He references David, of course. He references the, the messianic prophecy that comes out of David and how David is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, which of course we preached on and looked at in the reign of Jesus Christ, excuse me, reign of David in 2 Samuel earlier this year. But as he got down to verse number 37, these men, it says there, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And of course, we see conversion happen. So pick it up in verse number 41. I want to read 41 down through 47 and just highlight a statement in verse number 46 for a moment. And then we'll get into looking at what God has done all year long and what he continues to do to restore the body principle in his local church. Verse 41 says this. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. They didn't even need an extra special lesson. They knew what they were supposed to do. They were to testify what had happened to them. So they stand up, get baptized, proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, be a testimony, show obedience. And then verse number 41 continues, and that same day gives us an idea. There was added unto them about 3,000 souls. So good. That sounds good. That's a good way to start a church. I remember when the church started out here, it wasn't with 3,000 brand new souls, but there was 66 people that signed the charter, and they got started back in 1997. And by the way, I heard that we're going to celebrate our 25th anniversary soon. You say, how soon? Well, that's May of 2022. Do your math. It's not far away. It's about 18 months away. When you think about celebrating 25 years that this church has been going, I don't know. It would be pretty cool if 3,000 souls have been saved since then, since the beginning. That is not true, but we've seen hundreds of people come to Christ. We've seen hundreds of people discipled. We've seen people go out and serve in ministry, sending out missionaries and things that have happened in churches and things like that. So it's powerful and it's wonderful, and we proclaim and praise God for all that. But as we continue in our passage, let's just, just watch what happens here. There's no manual here, right? There's no booklet. They're not carrying around the Texas Receptus. They're not carrying around any type of Greek, Hebrew. Uh, they're, just, they're carrying around the testimony of God in the Old Covenant. And they're carrying on with what Jesus Christ has done as the Word of God has been passed on from the Lord Jesus Christ speaking and them telling people and proclaiming the truth. Now you sit there with an electronic Bible. Some of you have a paper Bible. You've got all kinds of toys and tools. When we go to have our Bible Institute course, you've got a notebook, you've got an electronic pad, you've got highlighters, you've got pens. Some of you take notes. How many of you like taking notes? Raise your hand real quick. A few, oh, number, oh my gosh. We better have some, better be a good message today. I hope the notes turn out all right. I love taking notes. I love writing down notes. I love, I mentioned that out last week. So, so, but here they are just going at it. They're just going at it. And verse number 42 is pretty cool. Wouldn't you say, verse number 43, you say, hey, they continue steadfastly. I know the passage. Well, that's unfortunate that maybe it's the same way with how many people say, I, I know who Jesus is. I know about him. But do you really know him? Do we really know this? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. So that means that their commonness 
is uncommon in their faith. Uncommon, our theme for our Acts 1A conference. It says in verse number 45, they didn't even have to take up any special collections. They sold their possessions and goods, parted them to all men as every man had need. Pretty cool. Things are cranking. Now look at verse number 46 and 7. Again, you hear a little bit about this in December, of where God would have us to go in accordance with this project of God for the church. It says in verse number 46, off of the Acts 1-8 vision of God for the apostles, then the day of Pentecost is there, and all this happens, 3,000 souls, as far as we know at this point, but many coming, he says what happened in verse number 46, and they, who's the they? All of those souls, all the apostles, the early church, it says, they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, they hung out and did this. I'm sure it was a lot different, but they hung out. They got together. They used to have the old covenant. They got together with the Hebrews of the Hebrews and the Pharisees of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they learned about the old ways. But now they're at the temple with the new way, the new covenant, the new and better testament, as it says in Hebrews, the better covenant. Testament, the better covenant, the better sacrifice. And they're continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house in verse number 46. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. You just got to pause for a minute and wonder. Would we do that well today? We need to. That's part of how God restores the body principle in his local church. That there is gladness and singleness of heart. But that's the Holy Spirit bubbling up inside of you by the word of God's teaching inside of you. So there's actually evidence, like last week, proof of a new life that's in you and me. There should be gladness and singleness of heart. Tell me a little bit about Jesus. Listen, there's what, listen, all of you are different. But there's one single thing very key and common to all of you. Jesus Christ. Now, gladness and singleness of heart over Jesus Christ. What are you going to do? Argue about his deity? He's Jesus. Argue about what he's done for you? He's done everything for you. Argue about and, and not have a singleness of heart? No, you're going to be unified over Jesus Christ. You're going to be glad about Jesus Christ. You and I, in that one accord principle, are going to say, what? They did eat meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Not complaining and criticizing and whining about all different subjects. You know what? Those other subjects, they can really get you down into the place of those arguments over stuff. How about the gladness and singleness of heart is going to be over what? Verse 47. Praising God, comma. Praising God. You don't even have to yell. Praise God. You want to tell somebody? You want to give somebody praises? What are you going to do? Send them a note. That's nice. You're a wonderful husband, but I'm not going to tell you. I don't think the praise went very, very well. Well, I love to praise you, but I'm going to hold it back to myself. When you praise God, do you not say something? Do you not yell and scream and holler and sing? Why don't we sing? Why don't we sing the songs? Don't like the words, don't like the lyrics. I'm not picking, I'm just, what's wrong? Because there's something about praising God. Forget about the fact that everyone around you has a worse voice than you, and they're messing you all up because you've got such an incredible voice. I know that all of you probably are looking, oh man, I know, I, guess I can't believe Bill's singing like that. He's ruining my tone. Oh my gosh. Praising God. You are glorious. You are good. You are wonderful. You are forgiving. You are kind. You are loving. You are full of mercy. You're tender mercy. And just go on and on and on. You say, well, that's just hokey and what? What's happened? We need to allow God to restore the body principle in us because the body of Christ sings, speaks, yells, whispers, and says, praise God. Ye the Lord. You got anxiousness?
Praise God. You got fear? Praise God. You got doubts? Praise God. When you went into your first day at work, you were anxious and nervous. Went into your new job, you were worried. That's the same stuff. It goes on all the time for everybody. You don't understand what I go through. Really? Do we really need to go into that area of time when we could say, let's praise God. Let's praise God. Because he continues in verse number 47 in praising God and saying, guess what? Having favor with all the people after they continue daily, one accord, breaking bread, eating with uh, meat with gladness and singleness, praising God, bam, God says, here, here's a special gift from me by grace. Here's the favor that I want to give you, praising God. When God hears us praise him today for this morning, God's going to say, hey, this is what I love hearing. It says, and the Lord added to the church daily as such, excuse me, as should be saved. Often people, after pastors preach through this uh, message or this text and say, this is the key for us building a bigger church. God, if we just do all these things, if you just, if you people just would do what you're supposed to do, if you would just do your stuff, if God can't believe we haven't grown, we haven't had people get there, will you just do what you're supposed to do? Really, that's the way this is going to go here? That we just canceled out gladness and singleness of heart. I'm not having a glad heart here, I'm getting mean. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about praising God, one accord, breaking bread, having a sweet time in the Lord, and they didn't even have to have a discipleship material a manual. Isn't that awesome? Because they were discipled by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I think it went pretty good there. If you want the Holy Spirit of God to really teach you, spend some time alone with God in his word. Some of you have done that, and that's why you walk with the Lord like no other but there's been people and God uses people and so these people are being used by God in the early church because it says in verse number 45 again as every man had needs so needs were met verse number 46 and on and on continued so all of that as an introduction to say we just need to praise God we just need to be praising ing which means continual not ed I praised him or not just praise right now but praising continually praising God verse number 47 is powerful because that's what we'd like to do throughout this year and saying look at what God has done from the beginning of the year and looking at 2020 and how we started we had the Lord's Supper we had prayer night we had creative faith we had all kinds of ministry stuff going on we had taken to the streets we're going to, and then, you know what we had a Zambri interest interest meeting uh, some of you went to that like I want to go to Zambia we didn't go but again, we had a meeting, and people showed up. Celebrate life. We had Rachel House come in a regional mission, and we talked a little bit. We gave over $2,000 to the baby bottle drive, those little baby bottles. What a great way to partner with the work that gives the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We had baptisms and things like that. We had our Bible Institute registration in the spring, and we had our spring semester. We also continued with our, our men's study on, uh, on, uh, in the coffee house, and then, of course, it had to get moved to zoom we had taken to the streets again in february we then had some co-ed volleyball over in grain valley i don't know if we'll be able to do it this year we'll wait to see how god would allow us it was an outreach and then we had discover we haven't had discover since february but we're, we've been having one we just actually had our first discover class last sunday and a few of you were able to come a few different people have come we're going to finish up today and talking to some people about our church and the, uh, the foundation and the focus, the family, and our future of the church. And so we had Discover. That was the last time was February. That's a long time ago. Wow. Oh. But then we continued in the women's ministry with prayer night and different things. And we had our ministering hearts uh, breakfast and, and uh, got together everybody to get ready for ADP sports for the year. And everybody got a cool little pull pullover. Pretty cool. Then we had our men's conference and we were cranking. We were doing all the things that God had set out for us to do. We were accomplishing all we, we got the signups going. You know, we had 245, 46 kids sign up for soccer back then. Can you believe that? Oh my goodness. That was April. Excuse me, that was February, March to get ready for April. Then we continued. Ah, we, we bounced the clocks forward and we were cranking up and then we were going to have men's softball. And then March 13th showed up. What happened on March 13th, Friday the 13th? 
Dun, 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 dun. Right? Put the brakes on. We had a really cool, I'm praying that God will allow us to do this music this year. This collection of music and praising God is so beautiful. It's one of the best arrangements I've seen of the songs for, of course, Easter time and Resurrection Sunday. Those things in March. We had all that in place. These are the, the slides for January, February, March, April. We're going to be doing all these things. We're going to, hey, our VBSC. We're going to have our vacation Bible sports camp. We're going to have our informational meeting. And that Sunday, uh, not as many people came because that Sunday right there was the last Sunday we got together in person for a very long time. So the coaches' clinics got canceled, the baptisms, the refit, the women's conference where women were signed up. We had to pull. And then we got to online Resurrection Sunday. There was a huge crowd of eight people in here when I preached that day. It was awesome. But between March 13th and that day, we had a couple of Sundays online. And you look at a camera there and a camera up there and sound people and people like uh, the crew upstairs and, and the people, the different singers, Pastor Dwayne and, and Rick Davis with uh, Maddie and Mason and all the things, gathering in the coffee house to do some stuff, going over there, having services in here so that you could follow us online. And I thank the Lord for all that we were able to do. And I thank God for what we were able to do for his glory and for his honor. And my Lord and my God, that was Easter. And then we went through a bunch of stuff. All these things that we did online. Who is that? That must be a much younger version. Daughters of the King at home. We did different Bible studies. I pause at this slide for a few seconds just to tell you, uh, again, I put that on a set of slides for our announcements back in April and May. Thank you for your faithfulness. I mean, thank you. Thank you. We never had to shut the lights off. We've never had to stop paying our employees, our health insurance. We didn't take any p p p p p p p p p p Thank you, Lord, that we didn't have to. I really, I thank, thank you, Lord. We're able to pay our mortgage and continue. Our mortgage is now down to 1.65 or 6 million, which is the original note that was taken out on the building. Do you remember that? We've already paid $1.3 million off on our debt. We're able to keep on paying our mortgage. Well, you think all this is free? Just kidding. No, you don't because you've been faithful. Money's in the bank. We keep on stashing money in the bank. We keep on stashing money in the bank. We're able to bring a full-time pastor on board July 1st, pay his health insurance benefit with his family. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So I want to say thank you for your faithfulness, everyone online, everyone gathered, because... Truly, God's the author. Praising God. And we need to praise God for that. And I thank God for working in all of you and for all of you staying faithful to things so that we could continue with things on Zoom. We had to buy a, a bigger account with Zoom. No problem. We were able to pay that bill. We were able to do things online. We had to pay for things online. We have to pay for different things. They're not free. Everything we host, everything you do. We didn't do all that stuff because we had no need to do it. Thank you, Lord, that we have the money to do it. So we could be online with our Sunday groups, with our investors, with our prayer team that gets together in the morning. Open all day and open all night. That's what we believe that God would allow us to do with sermons, sermon notes, uh, midweek devotions, putting up updates. Remember all that we've been able to do. Listen, I'll just remind you, if you go to First Bible ADP, we're getting, we've been working on something for so long. We've done so much and had so much to do to get things reset in the way we'd like to have it. But in the meantime, we have been updating so that if you go and look at audio messages or you look at video stuff or you go to the YouTube stuff or you go to the Facebook stuff, Listen, you should go online and listen to some of the stuff that came out of the Acts 1A conference. I'm not promoting, I'm just saying for you to listen to those that preach, for Brian, for Brother Brian to be preaching, 
just tremendous word and Bobby and Alex and, and, and Crystal and, and Tammy and go listen to what God had to say through them and praise God for that. That's what we've done to put things out there. There's many resources. And then we began on May 31st to get together with our guidelines and everything that we're doing for the glory of God, praising God. Our Sundays on July 5th, after five or six Sundays, we're able to offer things in the fellowship hall. Then offer something, of course, in the fellowship again, fellowship hall again, but also Faith Place got going. Thank you, God, for Pam Snow and her team of children's ministry workers. Thank you for the infant nursery people. Thank you for the toucans. Thank you for everyone over there doing all that they're doing. Thank you. Because we're praising God for all that he's done. And we got back to our prayer nights and got back to the, oh, we had to cancel VBSC completely. Then we had a family picnic. I don't know if some of you came out, all of us that came out. I had a ball. I don't know about you. What a great time we had. And God has been continuing to restore the body, the fellowship, the time together. Then those crazy kids, they decided, hey, we're going to have camp. And they went and, 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 they, and they did it out in the sports park. You know. Obviously, I've shared this before. You must think that I really love Josh Extra Special to let him tear that field up. It was, it's not even, it's not my field. It's God's and it's yours. And some kids came to Jesus. And some lives were changed and some relationships were built. And the youth group is thriving in high school and junior high. They're endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. They're building something on one spirit, one God, one baptism. This is the way you do things according to God's will. And you praise him for that. Then Happy Five Soccer came. And yeah, there was 240-something kids signed up. A lot of them opted out. And we ended up with about 180 to 190 kids. We had 20 coaches, 20 assistant coaches and helpers. Teenagers, thank you for all that you did. Junior high and high school, we had coaches clinics and all the kids that were out there. We got our Acts 1-8 Bible Institute continues to go. We're in a couple of different classes right now doing Hebrews and James and doing the book of Proverbs. We've been continuing. We started doing our, our we're going to had the Lord's Supper. Next week we're going to have the Lord's Supper. We've been doing it close to the end of each month. It's been great to be able to do that. Thank you. We had our Sunday, excuse me, our summer camp celebration on a Wednesday. Of course, then soccer got cranking on September 12th. We were able to have a tailgate party out in the parking lot and a bunch of you that came. We had a great time. Those of you that didn't come, eh, maybe you can come to next year's. It was such a sweet time. And there was more food out there. Oh my goodness. Praise the Lord, but the fellowship, restoring the body in the Lord Jesus Christ and his local church. That's what he's been doing. That's all that he's been doing. We had our Wednesdays, and we had our missions on Wednesdays, and each one of the Wednesdays had different missionaries come in. And we did some on Zoom. Uh, David Godrone, he came in from Columbia on Zoom. We had Alex Chippy. He, he flew 8,000 miles to be here from Zambia, and of course, Steve Kern on last Wednesday, a couple Wednesdays ago. And of course we had our Acts 1-8 conference. And again, I just mentioned that earlier. What a sweet time we had. The theme of Uncommon, which is on the wall there. And you go through that whole thing, you go, wow. Wow, Pastor, we have had the opportunity to see God restore the body principle in his local church. Now you've got a six-week Bible study that we've been able to have. We had our family field day. Go to Colossians chapter number three. And I'm going to speak on three verses for about 15 minutes. So just, just stay with me here because this is the principle that ties together praising God. The family field day was tremendous. And we were able to uh, really walk through our first part of November. Now it's November 15th. Ah! We'll have the Lord's Supper as I mentioned. There will be no Wednesday night service because it's just before Thanksgiving. We've got Thanksgiving. I just sent out a, an email yesterday and reminded you, hey, it's Thanksgiving, just a few days away. Nothing is beyond his grace. We went through that study for the first six months of the year. And then God had us go through a Bible study on Wednesday nights. What a great study we had in the book of Nehemiah, Restoring the Body, a study in Nehemiah. What a great book on leadership principles and revival. And God really brought such a great group of people out to do that. Some are on, online. Thank you for that. And then we had our study in the Sermon on the Mount. We just finished up last week, Life in His Kingdom. And again, we're back to only Jesus. Only Jesus. God is doing it. He is doing it. 
And over the next three Sundays I mentioned earlier, we're going to just walk through this simple idea that praising God 2020 for the next three Sundays is, he is doing it, let's give thanks, and then let's continue. Continue for his glory and see what he will continue to do because it is an ING thing. We're praising God and God's restoring and God's doing it. And he's continuing to ING, continuing to do what he said. He is doing it. He is doing it. Are we aware of what God has been doing? Are you? Are you aware? Are you alerted? Are you paying attention? Are you able to see it? Or, really quick, let me just be a little bit more personal. What has God done? Not on the slides and all that stuff and through that, but what has God been doing and what are you aware of in your life and in someone else's life? Hey, the only way you're going to know if God is restoring the body, the vessel that houses the Holy Spirit through the Word of God is for you to say, hey, how are you doing? How are you dealing with anxiousness and doubt and wonderment? How are you doing with this incredible opportunity in the time we live in to crank it up and proclaim Jesus Christ? How did God restore the body of Christ? He got people together. He did it by his word. He did it by God's people. He did it through ministry. That's what he does. He did it out of Colossians chapter number three. And our Bible study on Wednesday has been absolutely tremendous already. We'll be in our third Wednesday. And it's been a great crowd of people. There was a bunch of people online as well. And I'm thankful for you. And if you need to have uh, the ability to follow along, the notes are online. If you want a hard copy of that, you can call the office and come pick it up. But here we're at studying the Bible and looking at Colossians chapter number 3 and saying, what have you done to restore the body, Lord, and how do you do it? How does restoring the body reveal nothing is beyond his grace? Of course, referencing our study that he gave us in the reign of David. God constantly restored the relationship with David and him. And David then had to do his part to restore the relationship. That's something that we see in our lives in the church. We're different than David. We do have the beautiful, beautiful, perfect word of the Lord in a bound or electronic version and accessing everything from the old to the new. You say, well, he got a little bit of insight from Nathan the prophet. Yes, he did write a couple of things I heard. And of course, by the Holy Spirit's inspiration, we know that a lot of the beautiful words that we read in this Bible are from God, of course, through David. But here we are in Colossians chapter number 3. And because we've been in this study, God just led me to this simple place. Three verses. Verse number 12, 13, and 14. Let me read all three. And then I just want to make some simple Simple comments and references. If you take notes, you can write down the references of what extra scriptures are there, and you can look them up later, but it'll be a good Bible study for you this week. Or you can come to the Colossians study on Wednesday nights. Here you go, verse number 12. Putting on, therefore, as the elect of God. Okay, so put on, therefore. Therefore what? Well, it's therefore. That's what it's there for. But Christ is all in all, verse number 11, and in all, only Jesus Christ. Therefore, because you are in Christ, the elect of God, when you're born again, you get put into God's elect. You're not born again, you're not in God's elect, period. Some people believe that they've been engrafted into something by them just thinking, well, I guess I'm part of the Israel's elect. No, you're not an Israel elect person. That's for God to determine for his nation. But when you're born again, you become part of the elect of God. If you are not born again, you are not the elect of God. Understand? If you wonder what that means, give me a call or send me an email and I send you and we'll talk it through and I'll show you scripture because the bottom line is that the elect of God are truly the church, the body of Christ. And that's in Christ that you are in the elect. Not, well, I'm waiting for God to save me so I can be part of the elect because I do, I do think that maybe it's possible that, oh, really? So now we've just canceled out the understanding that God is not 
like at work all the time with his word. He is at work, and he has compelled you and me to go into witness. So, as the elect of God, God's church, the body of Christ, you know what you're supposed to do as holy and beloved? You know what you're supposed to do? Bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against you, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So you're supposed to put on, therefore, as the elect, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. You're supposed to put on bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, on and on. He says in verse number 14, to really get it strong, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. This is the praising God for the next few minutes in the scriptures. Thank you, God, for the honor and privilege it is to be born again. And as the elect of God in the church of God, the body of Christ, as you has restored us and put us back together and reconciled our relationships with one another, what do you want us to do? Well, here's the first one. I'm just going to go through each one, about a minute each. Just follow along. If you want to take notes again, write down the scriptures at the bottom and follow along to the practical teaching of the Word of God through just following in each verse. It says there that there is mercy. Well, what does it say there? I hear it says bowels of mercies. What does it mean to have bowels of mercies? Well, the bowels are those places that are regarded as a seat of more violent passions, such as anger and love. But the Hebrews, it's a seat of the tenderer affections, of kindness, benevolence, compassion. Hence, our heart, tender mercies and affections, the heart is which the mercy resides. So why does he say that? He's saying the bowels, with inside, in your heart, the grace of God restores your ability to have mercy in your heart to execute, to give to other people. You say, well, I'm going to have to look up all those Bible verses. Good. Prove God to be true because the Bible says, if there be, therefore, any consolation Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, that's Philippians chapter number 2, which I don't even have up there. So understand that your scripture proves it out. Write those down as notes. What's the second thing you see there? God's grace restores our words with kindness. What is kindness? Kindness is goodness. It is faithfulness. It's a, a, a beautiful thing of how we extend through God's incredible love for us and saving us by his grace to use words with kindness. God's grace restores our words with kindness. What does 2 Samuel 9, 1 through 7 talk about? Mephibosheth. Everybody remember that guy? Mephibosheth very clearly says, with words, Paul says to him, hey, is there any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? It doesn't even say that he's expressing kind words. He's saying, I want to show the kindness of God by speaking it. And then David says in verse number six, hey, Mephibosheth, and he says, Behold, thy servant, I'm right here. And then David says, fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. That's pretty cool stuff. That's God's grace restoring our words with kindness. I gotta have those kind of words. What's the next one say there? Well, it talks about the humbleness of, of the mind. What's the humbleness of mind simply mean? It means, look, I have to have a humble opinion of myself. It says here in Strong's Concordance, a deep sense of one's moral littleness. Ah. Wow. Okay. That's what humbleness of mind, lowliness of mind, Modesty, humility, a deep sense of one's moral littleness. It says in Ephesians 2, excuse me, 4, 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another. It says in 1 Peter 5, likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the older. Ye all, yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace 
to the humble. We're supposed to be clothed with humility, that humbleness of mind. God's grace restores our mind with humility. He also gives the ability for us to be restored in our deeds with meekness. It says in verse number 17, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, or all in the name of the do all in the name of the Lord. What kind of deeds? All those acts, all those things that God's allowed you to do. God's grace restores our deeds with meekness. Do you do your deeds with meekness? Meekness means mildness, gentleness. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love or in the spirit of meekness? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.21. How's my meekness? How about my long-suffering? How about my forgiveness? Well, he mentions long-suffering next. You see, God's grace restores our ministry, the way we minister, how we can minister, maybe the ministry that God's given you, he restores it through his grace with long-suffering. The Bible says in 2 Timothy about preaching the word, being instant in season, right? Some of you have heard that one, right? We know what it says there. It's like, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And sometimes we leave off that part. Well, in 2 Timothy 4, 2, it says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. The whole verse, though, says, Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You may have to suffer long. When you reprove, when you rebuke, when you exhort the ministry of preaching, the ministry of God's own hand in your life that he has given you to minister where you're supposed to minister, he's saying, I'll give you the grace to restore your ministry with long-suffering. That's what he's telling the church at Colossae, as you need to make Jesus Christ preeminent. The next verse, we read it earlier, says two things. Two of the faves. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Is this when one of those times we take the black magic marker and we draw a line through a couple of verses? No, we can't do that. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. These are huge and very, very important. We're supposed to put on the forbearance. What does it mean to forbear? Now, I've always kind of said put up with things. Well, I believe that's okay, but the concordance says to hold up. To hold oneself erect and firm, stand. And having done all, to stand, right? To sustain, to bear, to endure. So what does it mean to forbear? God's grace, it says up there on the screen, restores our resolve with forbearing. What does it mean to have resolve? Well, the noun means one part. The verb means to fix in on purpose, to determine in your mind. So we need to have God's grace to restore our resolve with forbearing, to stand, to stand, to sustain, to bear, to endure, put on forbearance, to hold up or to hold back. God is forbearing towards sinners. Will we not be the same? God's grace restores our resolve with forbearing. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 that's up there has so much good stuff. It's Paul's teaching and also exhorting and also getting some feedback from the church at Corinth. And as his letter is writing in, in that ver and the verses in chapter number 11, he's telling them, look, you've got, just got to stand. You've got to stand for what's right. He says in verse number 19, For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing yourselves are wise. Don't worry about the fools. If, you know what's, if you're wise in the Lord and wise in the word, that's fine. You can forbear the fools. You realize how easy it could be when we're stronger in the Lord to allow God's grace to restore things? Here's the last couple. God's grace restores our person. In Jesus the person you are in Jesus Christ God's grace restores 
our person with forgiving. Do you remember when he first forgave you? And the peace that flooded your soul. Remember when you were forgiven? And you shouted for joy and you screamed and you went, wow, I feel different. I'm forgiven. For someone that's never experienced the forgiveness of God for the first time through calling on the name of the Lord by faith in Jesus Christ, to say, Jesus, I understand that you are the one and the only one. Holy God, I call out to you. Please save me. I'm tired of my life. I confess that I'm not worthy, but I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you, God, had raised him from the dead. Please save my soul. Do you remember that forgiveness that came? Well, God's grace restores our person in Christ with forgiving. We're supposed to put on forgiveness. It's, it's really simple, but it's sometimes very, very difficult. Because again, the scriptures tell us, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. This is part of God's restoring principles, restoring the, the incredible body, body principle in the local church. That's how he does it. 2 Corinthians 2 has some beautiful stuff. It tells us so that contrary wise ye ought rather to forgive him, comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Forgive, forgive. That's where God's grace gives you the ability so he restores our person in Christ with forgiveness. The last piece comes out of this verse. It's simple. Simple again, simple outline, simple words, simple word of God, practically speaking, studying the Bible, above all things, put on charity. So how do I put on charity? We know that we hear about God's grace and God's favor working on sinners' lives, and then we see how God gives you this new heart, this new life, this Spirit of God fruit in you, and you have this love, joy, and peace, right? And we talk, 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 constantly talk about it. So yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, God's grace restores our unity with charity. Well, I got a few verses up there, 1 Corinthians 13. We know that those verses are talking about charity. Well, the Bible teaches us through the concordance that charity means affection, goodwill, love, benevolence, the agape, as we look at it, affection or benevolence. We see that as this incredible, dear, deep love that knows no bounds, that charity suffereth long, that charity never faileth. And ab now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. That's this incredible charity that Paul's talking about at the church of Colossae. They had lost track of Jesus Christ and his preeminence. If any man have a quarrel against you, as even as Christ forgave you, okay, I'll do that. And then he goes to verse 14 and says, oh, above all things, put on charity. Put on charity. I thank the Lord for how he's doing that in this body. I see so many of you love one another by grace. I see how God's grace has restored your unity with charity. I see how God has put things together. I see how the gatherings on Sundays and the gatherings in the middle of the week in the places where people are getting together in their small groups and endeavoring to be together. I see the youth group, the children's ministry, I see all these incredible things. And, and here's the thing that goes back to that last question earlier that I asked, which is the last question tying together right now. How would you know that God had restored the body unless you went and talked to somebody? You gotta go ask somebody, what has God done to restore your relationship with Him? What has God done to build your relationship with Him and other believers during this time? What is God doing to allow you to see that He's not giving you the spirit of fear, but a power and a love of a sound mind? It's it's just every day that battle to say, no matter what the conditions around you are, will I live in God's grace? And allow him, as I witness what he has done as a pastor, I'm honored. I witness God's restoration in our body. What is God doing to restore you personally? Because he's done so much in the body. Before we pray, I just have you just look around. 
I know you're all looking at me. You're tired of looking at me. Look around and see everybody that's around. And you see the different people that are here. And you go, oh, oh. And each week there's different people that come to gather. The restoring of the body is not just continually getting together at the temple. <laughs> it's more than that. Ask somebody what God's doing to restore their vessel while God asks you what he's doing to restore your vessel. Please bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for our time and your word. It's been powerful and beautiful and good to see all the things that you have done. Now, Father, I know in the name of Jesus, a lot of that is just words up on a screen. But when we open up your word, we see that these are the living words. And we're supposed to put on things as the elect of you, God. So I pray, I pray, God, that you will just restore each and every vessel, each and every piece and part of the body individually. I know a lot of things have happened corporately in the congregation, but I pray that you'll do things personally in people's lives. I ask you, Lord God, to bring your scripture alive. I look forward to our Wednesday Bible study, but I thank you for right now. And as God, we are dismissed. I pray that we would catch a handle on what it means to be restored in the body of Christ and restored with you personally in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. Please stand for a moment. I'm just going to allow the music to play. If you want to pray right there, that would be great. If you want to spend some time with the Lord, that's cool. I'll give you about a minute to just kind of look at what that question says back there in the verse before. I mean, the slide before. What is God doing to restore your vessel? Please take some time to pray.